I'm James Glover, Director of Product Management, Routing and Switching at Siena. Uh, happy to be here. Always grateful to, to uh, be at this conference. Uh, where else would you rather be than right here, right now? And, you know, my talk here is going to be about taking IP optical convergence to the next level. Um, and we got to think about what that means. In order to take something to the next level, we need to take a look back at where we've been, evaluate where we are, then we can talk about where we're going, right? So let's do that a little bit. So at Siena, we have a concept known as the adaptive network, which has several major components. And every network vendor here has some kind of similar concept to this. And a lot of these concepts were born in conversations that actually took place at this conference. So in this example, I have, first of all, software control and automation. There's some kind of functionality in the network that's serving as that, sometimes we call it a domain controller. It's doing discovery, inventory, I'm visualizing the network, and I'm pa calculating paths, and I'm programming services. And what am, I, what am I programming? I'm looking at a programmable network infrastructure. And then we've gone through years now of open API discussions and how many different forums. Um, you may remember back before the pandemic that we had an open conference for everything that was possibly open in software. Uh, there was a conference for it. We've kind of consolidated those down now because we don't need 63 different open conferences anymore. Uh, and largely because we're already delivering on these open APIs and interfaces. The next piece, and this is a very hot topic. I'm based in Silicon Valley in California where the job role of data scientist is probably the, the hottest job in the Valley right now. And the idea of analytics and intelligence and all the hype that's going around that, there's always some kind of reality supporting the hype. So the idea of getting to predictive analytics and machine learning and leveraging the, the, the data that we're collecting from the network and f figuring out how to swim through those data lakes that we've been building. And then next, of course, uh, every vendor has a services organization that helps all of the customers figure out how to interpret this information and build a closed loop automated network. So that's part of the journey of where we've been. And if we look at it in this forum, we then applied that to end-to-end -to -end networking principles. It was in this forum that we first started discussing concepts of segment routing, for example, and building end-to-end -end networks. And if I zoom in on this example, we would talk about business outcomes. We all had definitions of how we would deliver speed, how we would deliver efficiency, how the network would be more reliable. And those principles are still in existence today. As a matter of fact, I would argue that every decade in this industry, we've talked about how to deliver more speed, how to become more efficient, and how to be more reliable, and that will continue, right? But if we get back to the segment routing topic, you know, it wasn't that long ago that in this example, we're taking binding SID, which I know is not everyone's favorite. But I can remember when Jeff Tansura, who is the IETF working group chair for routing, came here and gave us an, introdu an introduction to binding SID. And that was the next evolution to help us deal with brownfield networks and to build SID stacks and go across the entire network. But here's the issue with this paradigm, and this is still where we've been. It was great. We talked about domain controllers receiving feedback from the network and updating the policies, and we pushed the new label stack down. All of that is still useful today. But this is not the end-to-end -end network. And there is a bias in the way we've been talking about everything. And it looks like this. If this is the entire world as we know it, then the world looks like this. Everything is a single layer. Even today, we were having conversations about how to take different types of technology and emulate it across this flat universe. So what we need to consider is, collectively, we have what I call network layer bias. And this is something that is becoming more and more prevalent, that our understanding of the universe was too flat. 
And so we need to have a different kind of outlook. Now, we are to understand that when we talk about closed loop automation, we need to do it in a three dimensional world. And those three dimensions, for the purposes of our conversation on IP optical convergence, include not just the routing layer, but the optical and the photonic layer underneath. And I would challenge you, if you do not know the difference between the optical and the photonic layer, you've been living in a flat world. So just look at the technical foundation examples here on the left. In the IP world, you'd have some kind of VPN service with OEM. We talked about path computation in our binding SID example. We could talk about SRTE or traffic engineering and pump that into SRV6 next. If you want to do that, that's fine with me. The next layer underneath, you're muxing together uh, different amounts of bandwidth. You're going from the electrical into the optical domain. You might be able to create a 400 gig wavelength out of that material, right? And then finally, in the photonic, on the photonic layer underneath, it's basically flashing lights to the other end, right? So there's a, a way to take a look at what we can do to maximize efficiency in a three-dimensional network. Now, the thing is, each of these layers has a challenge. And each of these layers are faced with their own footprint and topology and life cycle management. So don't make the assumption that each layer in the network has an identical topology to the other layers. Because in reality, if you talk to your operations people and if you talk to your network planners, they don't. So your starting point to, to build and architect your three-dimensional network is one where you have diverse topologies that you have to deal with and diverse life cycles and diverse sets of assets in this network. What's more is each one of the layers in the network has a technical challenge. And we're just going to do three examples to get the point across. In the first example, the IP MPLS network is unaware of the OTN and photonic path diversity that is available, not to mention the bandwidth available for restoration. Okay, so it's trial and error because it's completely blind. Second, in the optical layer, it's unaware of any of the IP or VPN services that are running on top of it. And then third, in the photonic layer, it's unaware that any of the signaling is having any kind of a problem to reach the far end of the network. Okay. So what we need to do is figure out a way to mitigate these issues. And the way to do that is actually to capture metadata or characteristics from a given layer in the network and share that and synthesize it somehow so that the other layers can benefit from it. So somehow we're going to involve the domain controller and it's going to help us either collect or transmit changes based upon this metadata that we're, re we're receiving from different layers in the network. So let's take a few examples. First, in our, tech our technical response on the IP MPLS unawareness of the path diversity underneath it. The most common example we've talked about here is a better understanding of network diversity using SRLG. But now this is three-dimensional SRLG, so I actually know if the photonic layer underneath me is creating a diverse path or not. Right? I'm going to talk in a little bit about coordinated uh, restoration. Uh, this was actually something that Sienna presented last year. We'll come back to that in a second. On the optical side, you're unaware of any of the IP or VLAN IDs. Right? So here, if we could find a way to coordinate either VLANs or pseudo wires, create some kind of awareness from the router, and we can map it to the OTN port that we're using, we can get some synergy out of that, right? And then finally, on the photonic layer, if we could selectively enable uh, what they call channel margin gauge and find bandwidth that we need temporarily to create uh, restoration. And this isn't a scenario where you're in your worst case scenario. You're 
your primary failed, your backup failed, your backup to the backup failed, and now you're just hunting to restore high priority traffic. What can I do? What's available? That also was presented by Sienna just last year on how to do partial restoration, finding extra bandwidth in the photonic layer to help you do an IP restoration. All right, so let's take these principles, the adaptive network with the three magic chess pieces we have in the top right, and let's map them to a three-dimensional diagram. So notice all of the APIs that we have here. So thank you for all of your teamwork and cooperation across operators and vendors to bring us to this point where, okay, we have NetConf Yang, we have open APIs, we have initiatives, PSA, BGPLS, working with all of those things like TAPI, RESTConf, all of those pieces. We've needed every one of those pieces on the board, right? Uh, now, we look at the programmable elements in the network and what they're bringing to the table. Now, remember, we have three examples. Do you remember those three examples? The first one was we were going to do SRLG. So I need the layers underneath to transmit up for analytics and for sharing of information, that metadata of what's the, what's the path information? What are the values that we need to make a decision? And then I need the software control and automation to push that down programmable into uh, the routers. What was our second example? Our second example was I needed to understand some degree of service mapping so that I can put the right priority of traffic across the multi-layer network. So again, I'm collecting now information from maybe layer two, layer three, and I'm pushing that down into the optical layer so that we have a, a, a relationship there, right? So now it's I want, it's not just about plane reservations, it's about passenger identification to ride that plane, right? And then our third example was Really, I need to create some kind of a bandwidth burst in the photonic layer of the network. I'm going to scrape together some bandwidth as a last resort to kind of rescue uh, a service that we have already experienced multiple failures. Again, if you want to talk about that, we have our subject matter here uh, uh, in our booth, but it was also a, a Sienna presentation last year. So just three basic examples of three-dimensional networking. The idea is that from this day forward, we should be drawing our network diagrams differently because until now, the world was flat. And now we need to think that we live in a multi-dimensional world with multi-layer networking. And that's our reminder to you. All right. So in coherent routing, we have all of these things to summarize. We have the analytics and intelligence. We have software automation and control and we have a programmable set of infrastructure, right? So the summary of that history is the tools are useful and it, they keep getting better. Next was the adaptive network and working in closed loop automation. We've been talking about that for some time. The tools are even more useful when they're actually working together. Thank you, Karsten, for all of your work at EANTC. The tools are starting to work together. And then finally now, we're starting to see they work at their best when they are multi-layer in nature and we understand that there's a three-dimensional universe. This is the concept that we call coherent routing. And that is our challenge to you. Now, we've got to be able to advance from the middle of this diagram to the right. And we need a three-dimensional vocabulary, three-dimensional test plans, and three-dimensional benefits that are going to bring more value to the network. Thank you.